I love the Lord, for he died my soul to save. On Calvary, his dear life he freely gave. From realms above, Jesus freely came to die. That I might live some day with him on high. I love the Lord, he has been so good to me. He gave his life from sin to set me free. No greater love than is could ever be. I love the Lord because he first loved me. I love the Lord for he saved the lost from sin. He gave them life to be whole and free again, to live on high with him never more to die. Oh, praise his name, we'll see him by and by. I love the Lord, he has been so good to me. He gave his life from sin to set me free. No greater love than his could ever be. Because he first loved me, I love the Lord for his love so full and free. He taught us why that our love like his should be to be like him and compassion freely give. Oh, bless his name, we then with him could live. I love the Lord, he has been so good to me. He gave his life, from sin to set me free. No greater love that is could ever be. I love the Lord because he first loved me. Good morning. We are continuing our journey through the scriptures. Let me sit you down and let you enjoy the view of the garden. A little birdie out there gathering its breakfast. And as we continue our journey through the scripture, David has lost his son uh, Absalom and has been uh, recount crowned king of all of Israel. We're picking up in 2 Samuel chapter 19, verse 31 with David's kindness to Barzillai. Barzillai of Gilead now arrived from Rogelim to conduct the king across the Jordan. He was very old, about 80, and very wealthy. He was the one who had provided king for the food during his stay in Manahem. Come across with me and live in Jerusalem, the king said to Barzillai. I will take care of you there. No, he replied, I am far too old for that. I'm 80 years old today, and I can no longer enjoy anything. 
food and wine no longer are no longer tasty, and I cannot hear the musicians as they play. I would only be a burden to my lord the king. Just to go across the river with you is all the honor I need. Then let me return again to die in my own town, where my father and mother are buried. But here's my son Kimham. Let him go with you and receive whatever good things you want to give him. Good, the king agreed. Kim Ham will go with me, and I will do for him whatever I would have done for you. So all the people crossed the Jordan with the king. After David had blessed and embraced him, Barzillai returned to his own home. The king then went on to Gilgah, taking Kim Ham with him. All the army of Judah and half the army of Israel escorted him across the river. An argument over the king, beginning in 2 Samuel 19, verse 41. But the men of Israel complained to the king that the men of Judah had gotten to do most of the work in helping him cross the Jordan. Why not? The men of Judah replied, the king is one of our own tribe. Why should this make you angry? We have charged him nothing, and he hasn't fed us or even given us gifts. But there are ten tribes in Israel, the others replied, so we have ten times as much right to the kings as you do. Why did you treat us with such contempt? Remember, we were the first to speak of bringing him back to be our king again. The argue continued back and forth, and the men of Judah were very harsh in their replies. The Revolt of Sheba, beginning in 2 Samuel 20, verse 1. Then a troublemaker named Sheba, son of Bichri, a man from the tribe of Benjamin, blew a trumpet and shouted, We have nothing to do with David. We want no part of this son of Jesse. Come on, you men of Israel, let's all go home. So the men of Israel deserted David and followed Sheba. But the men of Judah stayed with their king and escorted him from the Jordan River to Jerusalem. When the king arrived at his palace in Jerusalem, he instructed that the ten concubines he had left to keep house should be placed in seclusion. Their needs were to be cared for, he said, but he would no longer sleep with them. So each of them lived like a widow until she died. Then the king instructed Amasa to mobilize the army of Judah within three days and to report back at that time. So Amasa went out to notify the troops, but it took him longer than the three days he had been given. Then David said to Abish Abishai, The troublemaker Sheba is going to hurt us more than Absalom did. Quick, take my troops and chase after him before he gets into a fortified city where we can't reach him. So Abishai and Joab set out for Sheba, with an elite guard from Joab's army and the king's own bodyguard. As they arrived at the great stone in Gibeon, Amasa met them, coming from the opposite direction. Joab was wearing his uniform with a dagger strapped to his belt. As he stepped forward to greet Amasa, he secretly slipped the dagger from its sheath. How are you, my cousin, Joab said as he took him by the beard with his right hand as though to kiss him. Amasa didn't notice the dagger in his left hand and Joab stabbed him in the stomach with it so that it, his insides gushed out onto the ground. Joab did not need to strike again, and Amasa soon died. Joab and his brother Abishai left him lying there and continued after Sheba. One of Joab's young officers shouted to Amasa's troops, If you are for Joab and David, come and follow Joab. But Amasa lay in his blood in the middle of the road, and Joab's officer saw that a crowd was gathering around to stare at him. So he pulled him off the road into a field and threw a cloak over him. With the mass's body out of the way, everyone went on with Joab to capture Sheba. Meanwhile, Sheba had traveled across Israel to mobilize his own clan of Bichri at the city of Abel Beth Maacah. When Joab's forces arrived, they attacked Abel Beth Maacah and built a ramp against the city wall and began battering it down. But a wise woman in the city called out to Joab. Listen to me, Joab. Come over here so I can talk to you. As he approached, the woman asked, Are you Joab? I am, he replied. So she said, Listen carefully to your servant. I'm listening, he said. Then she continued, There used to be a saying, If you want to settle an argument, ask the advice of the city of Abel. I am one who is peace-loving and faithful in Israel, but you are destroying a loyal city. Why do you want to destroy what belongs to the Lord? 
And Joab replied, Believe me, I don't want to destroy your city. All I want is a man named Sheba, son of Bichri, from the hill country of Ephraim, who has revolted against King David. If you hand him over to me, we will leave the city in peace. All right, the woman replied, We will throw his head over the wall to you. Then the woman went to the people with her wise advice, and they cut off Sheba's head and threw it out to Joab. So he blew the trumpet and called his troops back from the attack and they all returned to their homes. Joab returned to the king at Jerusalem. Joab once again became the commander of David's army. Benaiah, son of Jehoadiah, was commander of the king's bodyguard. Adoniram was in charge of the labor force. Jehoshaphat, son of Ahalud, was the royal historian. Shiva was the court secretary. Zadok and Abiathar were the priests. Ira, the Jairite, was David's personal priest. Psalm 7, a psalm of David which he sang to the Lord concerning Cush of the tribe of Benjamin. I come to you for protection, O Lord my God. Save me from my persecutors. Rescue me. If you don't, they will maul me like a lion, tearing me to pieces with no one to rescue me. O Lord my God, if I have done wrong or if I am guilty of injustice, if I have betrayed a friend or plundered my enemy without cause, then let my enemies capture me. Let them trample me into the ground. Let my honor be left in the dust. Arise, O Lord, in anger. Stand up against the fury of my enemies. Wake up, my God, and bring justice. Gather the nations before you. Sit on your throne high above them. The Lord passes judgment on the nations. Declare me righteous, O Lord, for I am innocent. O Most High, in the wickedness of the ungodly, but help all those who obey you. For you look deep within the mind and heart, O righteous God. God is my shield, saving those whose hearts are true and right. God is a judge who is perfectly fair. He is angry with the wicked every day. If a person does not repent, God will sharpen his sword and he will bend and string his bow. He will prepare his deadly weapons and ignite his flaming arrows. The wicked conceive evil. They are pregnant with trouble and give birth to lies. They dig a pit to trap others and then fall into it themselves. They make trouble, but it backfires on them. They plan violence for others, but it falls on their own heads. I will thank the Lord because he is just. I will sing praise to the name of the Lord Most High. David avenges the Gibeonites, beginning in 2 Samuel 21, verse 1. There was a famine during David's reign that lasted for three years. So David asked the Lord about it. And the Lord said, The famine has come because Saul and his family are guilty of murdering the Gibeonites. So King David summoned the Gibeonites. There were, they were not part of Israel, but were all that was left of the nation of the Amorites. Israel had sworn not to kill them, but Saul, in his zeal, had tried to wipe them out. David asked them, What can I do for you to make amends? Tell me, so that the Lord will bless his people again. Well, money won't do it, the Gibeonites replied, and we don't want to see the Israelites executed in revenge. What can I do then? David asked. Just tell me and I will do it for you. Then they replied, It was Saul who planned to destroy us to keep us from having any place at all in Israel. So let seven of Saul's sons or grandsons be handed over to us, and we will execute them before the Lord at Gibeon, on the mountain of the Lord. All right, the king said, I will do it. David spared Jonathan's son Mephibosheth, who was Saul's grandson, because of the oath David and Jonathan had sworn before the Lord. But he gave them Saul's two sons, Am Armoni and Mephibosheth, whose mother was Rizpah, daughter of Aya. He also gave them the five sons of Saul's daughter Merib, the wife of Adriel, son of Barzillai, from Meholah. The men of Gibeon executed them on the mountain before the Lord. So all seven of them died together at the beginning of the Harley harvest, barley harvest. Then Rizpah, the mother of the two men, spread sackcloth on a rock and stayed there the entire harvest season. She prevented vultures from tearing at their bodies during the day and stopped wild animals from the eating them at night. When David learned what Rizpah, Saul's concubine, had done, he went to the people of Jabesh-Gilead and asked for the bones of Saul and his son Jonathan. 
When Saul and Jonathan had died in a battle with the Philistines, it was the people of Jabesh Gilead who had retrieved their bodies from the public square of the Philistine city of Bethshan. So David brought the bones of Saul and Jonathan, as well as the bones of the men the Gibeonites had executed. He buried them all in the tomb of Kish, Saul's father, at the town of Zelah, in the land of Benjamin. After that, God ended the famine in the land of Israel. Battles against Philistine giants, beginning in 2 Samuel 21, verse 15. Once again, the Philistines were at war with Israel, and when David and his men were in the thick of battle, David became weak and exhausted. Ishbibinob was a descendant of the giants. His bronze spearhead weighed more than seven pounds, and he was armed with a new sword. He had cornered David and was about to kill him, but Abishai, son of Zeruah, came to rescue and killed the Philistine. After that, David's men declared, You're not going out to battle again. Why should we risk snuffing out the light of Israel? After this, there was another battle against the Philistines at Gob. And they, as they fought, Sibekai from Hushesh killed Saph, another descendant of the giants. In still another battle of Gob, Elhanan, son of Jair from Bethlehem, killed the brother of Goliath of Gath. The handle of his spear was as thick as a weaver's beam. In another battle with the Philistines at Gath, a huge man with six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot, a descendant of the giants, defied and taunted Israel. But he was killed by Jonathan, the son of David's brother Shimea. These four Philistines were descended from the giants of Gath, but they were killed by David and his warriors. Battles against the Philistines, beginning in 1 Chronicles 20, verse 4. So we're hearing this again, kind of. After this, war broke out with the Philistines at Gezer. As they fought, Sibekai from Hushash killed Saph, a descendant of the giants. And so the Philistines were subdued. During another battle with the Philistines, Elhanan, son of Jair, killed Lami, the brother of Goliath of Gath. The handle of Lami's spear was as thick as a weaver's beam. In another battle with the Philistines of Gath, a huge man with six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot, a descendant of the giants, defied and taunted Israel. But he was killed by Jonathan, the son of David's brother Shimei. These Philistines were descendants of the giants of Gath, but they were killed by David and his warrior. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So our closing hymn this morning ought to be more familiar to you, was to me, than the first one we sang this morning. There's a garden where Jesus is waiting. So I invite you to take a deep breath and sing along with me. What have I done? Okay. Sorry, I had a slightly different setup this morning. So, let's take a deep breath <clears throat> and sing and exercise our lungs. Enjoy this morning. There's a garden where Jesus is waiting. There's a place that is wondrously fair. For it glows with the light of his presence. Tis a beautiful garden of prayer. Oh, the beautiful garden, the garden of prayer. Oh, the beautiful garden of prayer. There my Savior awaits, and he opens the gates to the beautiful garden of prayer. There's a garden where Jesus is waiting, and I go with my burden and care, just to learn from his lips words of comfort in the beautiful garden of prayer. Oh, the beautiful garden, the garden of prayer. 
Oh, the beautiful garden of prayer. There my Savior awaits, and he opens the gate to the beautiful garden of prayer. There's a garden where Jesus is waiting, who oh, cannot with his glory compare. Just to walk and to talk with my Savior in the beautiful garden of prayer. Oh, the beautiful garden, the garden of prayer. Oh, the beautiful garden of prayer. There my Savior awaits, and he opens the gates to the beautiful garden of prayer. There's a garden where Jesus is waiting, and he bids you come meet with him there. Just to bow and receive a new blessing, in the beautiful garden of prayer. Oh, the beautiful garden, the garden of prayer. Oh, the beautiful garden of prayer. There my Savior awaits, and he opens the gate to the beautiful garden of prayer. Let's see who else on here this morning. Good morning, Pam. Good morning, Rhonda. Good morning, Myra. Good morning, Jim and Peggy. Good morning, Patty. Good morning, Shirley. Hope everybody enjoys this lovely, lovely day. Um, I like that hymn. One of the things I really love about the sitcom Young Sheldon is uh, Mary's Prayer Garden in the backyard. So I invite you to take a moment to contemplate a place uh, in or around your home where you can... Um, get away from everything and clear your mind and have a few minutes along with the Lord. He's waiting for you there. And I'll see y'all back tomorrow morning at 8.